Hey listeners, I'm Brittany. And I'm Hallie. And welcome back to The Abyss. Don't forget to subscribe on whatever platform you listen on and give us a five-star review on Apple. That really helps us reach more people and kind of grow our little family. You can follow us on Instagram. You can like our Facebook page. Um, You can go to our website always and see more photos and more information, all of our sources and everything for each case that we talk about. And don't forget that our first book club episode will come out on February 7th. So be sure to tune in for that. We're going to be talking about the book The Whisper Man by Alex North. So make sure you've read up on that and we'll see you then. It's a really interesting book and we're excited to talk to you about it. In today's episode, we will be covering two eerie cases Both of them involve men who started acting really erratic around their family and friends, and then they just vanished, and their last sightings were on CCTV. Normally, the facts of a case help to clear up the story a little bit, but in these cases, all it does is confuse you more. These are the cases of Blair Adams and Lars Meetong. So let's jump into the abyss. Robert Dennis Blair Adams, known as Blair, was born December 28, 1964. He was from Surrey, British Columbia, and he worked as a foreman at his dad's construction company. There were two sides to Blair. Some people said he was incredibly sweet and kind, while other people said that he could be kind of confrontational and a little on edge, which I think can kind of describe a lot of people. Definitely depending on who's talking, you know, we all meet people and have different perceptions. In his 20s, Blair became addicted to drugs and alcohol, but he was working really hard on his sobriety. He had gone to AA meetings, but by the mid-90s, he had stopped attending those and decided just to continue his sobriety on his own. By that point, he had been sober for two years, and although some people were kind of worried that not going to the meetings meant that he was slipping on his sobriety, there was no evidence to suggest that he was drinking or using drugs at all at that time. In July of 1996, things got strange when Blair started presenting a lot of odd behaviors. He became very paranoid and moody, and he was careless at work. He wasn't properly locking things up, and he even left one of his paychecks and just didn't pick it up. His mother was understandably super worried about this when she saw his change in behavior and tried to get him to open up about what was going on with him, but he refused to tell her anything. He just made some sort of vague mentions about rumors that were being spread about him. And that was all he would tell her. His strange erratic behavior escalated after this. And he told family and friends he was going to visit an uncle in a different city. But that uncle happened to be away during this time. So he couldn't have gone to see him. He then confided in his friends that someone was after him trying to kill him. And that it was imperative that he cross the border into the U.S. This prompted his friends and co-workers to suggest that he see a doctor, but he flatly refused. He was completely convinced that someone was after him and that he was in danger. On July 7th, 1996, Blair quit his job and withdrew all of his money from the bank. He emptied his safe deposit box. He took all the cash, gold, all his valuables, everything he had, and took it with him. With this on his person, he then attempted to cross the border into the United States. He was stopped, and when Border Patrol found all of the cash and valuables on him, they refused to let him enter the United States. The amount of money and valuables made them suspicious that he might be involved in drugs or the drug trade in some way, and they also discovered that he had previous assault and drug charges. So with his access to the U.S. denied, Blair started to kind of weigh his other options. He decided to make a series of short trips visiting family and friends. He went to Vancouver to visit his girlfriend. Then he went to New Westminster to visit a friend. And finally, he ended up in Surrey to visit his mother. He was very emotional during these visits. He cried about losing a job that he had been super excited about just days earlier. And he came across very anxious. He even made mention that he did not want to stay at his apartment, that he didn't feel safe, and he was really scared for his life. On July 9th, Blair was caught in Canada trying to cross the border on foot at the Pacific Highway border crossing. It was mentioned that he had scrapes on his hands and legs, but it was unknown what he got the scrapes from. Ironically, there had been a vehicle theft reported earlier, and the car was discovered abandoned near the Pacific Highway border crossing. Furthermore, the description of the theft matched eerily to the physical appearance of Blair Adams. 
However, Adams denied being involved in the incident altogether and was released from custody due to a lack of evidence against him. The following day, on July 10th, Adams successfully entered the U.S. in a Nissan Altima. He went to the Seattle-Tacoma International Airport and purchased a ticket to Frankfurt, Germany. It may seem random that he would want to fly to Frankfurt, but he actually had many relations in the city. He had previously worked on a job for his stepfather in Frankfurt, as well as dated a woman there. When the woman was asked about the possibility of him popping in for a visit, she stated that she had not heard anything from him about visiting Frankfurt or her. After purchasing this ticket to Frankfurt, he spontaneously changed his mind and bought a ticket to Washington, D.C. So his mental state right now seems to be a little all over the place. We don't know what his method is. We don't know why he's changing his mind back and forth. We don't know why he's in such a rush to travel so quickly. After landing in Washington, D.C. around 6.45 a.m., Adams rented a Toyota Camry and started on another journey. He drove to Troy, Virginia, which is approximately two and a half hours from the airport in D.C. It was in Troy that he backed his car into a motorist, which solidified his location. However, he was in Knoxville, Tennessee later that day, so it's still July 10th, and that's approximately seven hours from the D.C. airport, so he really went on this little road trip after landing in D.C., at 5.30 p.m. in Knoxville, he was seen at a gas station called Strawberry Plains Pike. He confronted the cashier saying that he was having trouble getting into his vehicle. His keys weren't working at all. So the cashier called Gerald Sapp, who was an interstate repair service driver. Sapp got there and he immediately thought the situation was peculiar because Adams was trying to open his car with keys for a Nissan Altima, but he was driving a Toyota Camry. Sapp suggested to Adams that he should check his pockets for another key, but Adams wouldn't do it. Sapp ended up helping Adams out and drove him to the Fairfield Inn Motel that night and then proceeded to tow the Toyota Camry to a repair shop. We have some images of him at the front desk in the motel, which was the last time Adams was seen alive. On the CCTV footage, Adams is seen hanging around for about 40 minutes in the motel. He then bought a room for $100 and... And as the clerk was giving him back his change, he just turned away, didn't take the change, and left the hotel without a word, without his money. And Blair Adams never entered the room that he bought that night. On July 11th, 1996, around 7.15 in the morning, construction workers found a body in the parking lot of a motel that was being constructed on Crosswood Boulevard outside of Knoxville. This body was identified as Blair Adams. He was found with his shirt open and his pants off. His socks were laying next to him, and his pants were described as being removed in a way that someone wouldn't necessarily take them off themselves, so it looked like they had been removed by someone else. The socks were inside out, and one of his shoes was strangely placed under his head, kind of as if it was a pillow. The layout of his body sounds so abnormal that if I were to just read that somewhere, then I would think that it was fake or someone was exaggerating, but we actually read this in the real newspaper article from when it happened. Yeah, it's just such a bizarre setting to kind of try to imagine. And to make it even weirder, scattered around his body was about $4,000 in currency from Germany, Canada, and the U.S. In a sort of odd side note, the owner of one of the companies working on the site actually pocketed one of the $100 bills and a $10 bill from the scene, which were later recovered. Which is strange. Why would you take money off of a dead body and just leave it, not report anything? Yeah. Seems a little fishy. A little fishy. Blair also had a duffel bag with him, which contained maps, travel receipts. He also had a fanny pack, which you can see pictures of on our website. And this contained five ounces of gold, jewelry gold and platinum coins, keys, and sunglasses. He also had a fanny pack, which you can see pictures of on our website, and this contained five ounces of gold, jewelry, gold and platinum coins, sunglasses, and it also had the keys to the Toyota Camry. So he actually was in possession of these keys the whole time, we can assume. So that makes it even more strange that he was having so much trouble at the gas station previously. In one of his hands was a piece of hair, which was the only significant physical evidence in this case at all. 
An autopsy was performed by the University of Tennessee Medical Center, and they noted that Blair had many cuts and abrasions, his hands were very bloody, he had a really deep cut that looked like it had been sustained while he was being knocked to the ground, there was a wound on his forehead that looked like it had come from a crowbar or some kind of club, and tufts of his hair had been ripped out. There were even injuries that indicated that a sexual assault had taken place. There were no drugs or alcohol in his system, according to the toxicology report, and the cause of death was determined to be septic shock from a blow to the abdomen that ruptured his stomach. So Blair had sustained a pretty brutal beating. Like, that takes a lot of force to rupture the stomach just from one blow. Unfortunately, there were no witnesses to what happened to Blair, and police didn't really receive any tips on the crime itself other than a security guard on another construction site that claimed to hear a woman scream around 3.30 that morning. Because Blair was found with so much money and so many valuable items, police really ruled out robbery pretty quickly as a motive for his death. They couldn't find any evidence that he knew anyone in Tennessee or had any reason to be there, and trying to retrace his steps just baffled police further. Materials found around the construction site were tested as potential murder weapons, but none of them matched. Police did find two women that claimed to have seen Blair talking to a man in a Cracker Barrel parking lot, and a composite sketch of this man was developed, and you can see that on our website as well. David Davenport, the chief of the Knox County Sheriff's Office cold case unit, said, quote, We don't quit on a murder case. You go to these things that happened 40, 50 years ago, and they say, We thought you forgot about that. And I say, well, we don't forget, end quote. This case was featured on the show Unsolved Mysteries, and a lot of theories have been thrown out as to what possibly could have happened to Blair Adams. So we're going to go into some of those now. Some of the theories regard Blair Adams' mental state. They say that he may have had schizophrenia. Symptoms tend to begin in the mid to late 20s, and they include delusions, paranoia and hallucination, disorganized thinking and behavior, and maybe Blair Adams had a mental break that caused this erratic behavior, and that maybe this erratic behavior caused him to provoke someone that then killed him and didn't want to get in trouble. We know that schizophrenia can sometimes be triggered or worsened in people that are susceptible to it by drug use and alcohol, so... Maybe he was using again or something like that and it triggered this. But maybe he just had a predisposition to schizophrenia or some other sort of mental illness and that caused this chain of events to sort of unfold. There's also some theories that he had this mental break and then commit suicide, but I think just the gravity of his injuries and that's just very unlikely and even the police have always considered it a murder. So not to mention that the tuft of hair found in his hands would have had to have been his own unless he was defending himself from another person. Yeah, I don't know the physics behind it necessarily, but I just feel like hitting yourself hard enough to rupture your stomach would be incredibly hard. And I just, I don't see him beating himself up. I guess maybe it's possible, but I just don't, I don't see it. Another theory was that he had seen something maybe he shouldn't have seen. Maybe he was actually on the run from someone and it could have had to do with drugs that he had been involved in in the past or just something totally unrelated. Maybe he just stumbled upon something that he wasn't supposed to see and he decided he needed to go on the run. That would kind of explain he would buy a flight to somewhere else and then drive to a completely different location or he would fly somewhere and then immediately drive out of that place. It seems like he was kind of trying to throw someone off the trail. Also, this might be a little bit of a stretch, but as we're talking about it, I kind of had a thought, what if one of the construction workers were in on it? One of them took money from his wallet and didn't report it, and he was murdered at the construction site. It was super late, so unless someone broke in, who else would have had access? Sometimes construction workers are working late. Might have even been someone who was in the construction site itself. If you have any information on the Blair Adams case, please contact the Knox County Sheriff's Cold Case Investigations Unit at 865-215-2243, or you can email them at coldcase at knoxsheriff.org. And now let's jump into the Lars Matonk case. Lars Matonk was a young 28-year-old man living in Berlin, Germany. He worked at a power plant making good income, and he was considered an overall really positive and happy person. He had many friends and was even in a relationship with a young woman. Lars was considered 
to be extremely close to his family also. He even offered to help around the house after his father had a stroke whenever it was possible. On June 30th, 2014, Lars and some of his friends went on a trip that they had planned to Bulgaria, where they stayed at the Golden Sands Resort. The activities of the group were pretty normal for a standard vacation. They went to the beach, they went to the club, and they spent some time at the local bars. The only thing that struck his friends as strange was that Lars didn't seem to be eating his normal amounts. But this was of minimal concern to the friends because they were all there to just have fun and keep things light. However, on July 6th, Lars got into a bar fight against four local Bulgarians over a football game. He was a fan of a football player named Werder Bremen and defended his team and the player. Unfortunately, Lars took a pretty bad beating that night and he suffered from a ruptured eardrum and some facial bruising, possibly a concussion. Lars went to the doctor about his ear and was told that flying could hurt his ears even more, which is kind of strange because with the perforated eardrum, the air can pressurize pretty easily for the most part. Yeah, we read some things that said it might be kind of painful to fly with that and some things that said it'd be totally fine. So we don't know if maybe it was due to his other injuries, like a concussion or something, or if he was even told not to fly necessarily, but um, we'll get into sort of the theories later. That was sort of an ambiguous part of the story as we were researching. And because of his ruptured eardrum, they ended up putting him on an antibiotic, which, excuse my pronunciation if I'm not saying this correctly, but it was called Cephiroxim 500, and it was meant to prevent any infection from occurring in his ear. When it was time for all of them to return to Germany, Lars decided to stay behind in Bulgaria. His friends tried to stay to keep him company, but Lars told them that he would be okay and he would just lay low till he could leave. This was a popular season for travel in Bulgaria, so finding a hotel for an extra night was a little bit difficult. But finally, Lars found a room at Hotel Color. It was close to the airport and it was pretty cheap. We saw that these days it's about $16 to $40 a night, and he just wanted a place to crash till he could fly home. But this is when Lars' behavior took kind of a turn for the weird. He seemed to become afraid of something. He was really paranoid and on edge. He called his mother Sandra and told her he didn't feel safe anymore, and he even asked her to cancel his credit cards. He said the men that had beat him up before were following him and wanted to hurt him. And Sandra said, quote, I thought, God, my son is in danger. I could hear his heart pounding over the phone. He said people were trying to rob or kill him, end quote. So his mother could really tell that he was super afraid at this point. Later, Lars sent a text to his mother asking what the pills he was prescribed were for. His mother got the impression that Lars thought that people were after the pills he had, but they were just antibiotics, so it's unlikely that they would be all that coveted. Lars was later captured on CCTV footage, pacing the halls of his hotel, looking out the window, and even hiding in the elevator. He decided to leave the hotel at about 1 a.m. and did not return. No one has been able to find exactly where he went at that point or what he was doing in the middle of the night, but he called his mother again later in the morning to tell her that the people following him were closer. Sandra was obviously very concerned and decided to book Lars a flight home for the following day. Once Lars arrived at the Varna airport to travel home, he visited the doctor on site, Dr. Kosta Kostov, to examine his ear before the flight. Dr. Kostov said that his ears looked fine, but Lars seemed to be really anxious and wary about his medication. About 45 minutes after entering the airport, Lars supposedly became spooked by a construction worker who entered the medical service office while he was in there. Dr. Kostov said that he heard Lars mumble, quote, I don't want to die here. I have to get out of here, end quote. Lars then ran out of the medical office and out of the airport, which was all captured on the airport cameras. Once Lars made it outside of the airport, the parking lot cameras captured him running away, jumping a fence, and disappearing into the wooded area, never to be seen again. The footage on the airport cameras showed that Lars did not have any of his belongings with him, as he did upon entrance. He had left his wallet, passport, and cell phone all in the airport, and when the police later searched his bags, they found that there were no drugs present. The video of Lars running from the airport is on our website if you want to check it out. Just click on episodes and then read more on this Blair Adams and Lars Mitonk case and you'll be able to see all the visuals as well. We even have a visual of the airport and surrounding areas in 2014 compared to 2019 since 2020 isn't up on Google Pro yet. But it's easy to see that in 2014 the surrounding wooded areas seem to be a lot more dense than they were in 2019. Mitonk's mother hired a private investigator to try and find Lars, but they were unsuccessful. He seemed to have 
quote unquote, vanished into thin air. However, in 2016, there was a stretched glimmer of hope. The police in Brazil shared a photo of a homeless and confused man who was walking barefoot on the highway. Mitonk's mother was notified about the sighting because the man's remarkable resemblance to Lars Mitonk. Unfortunately, they were wrong about this man's identity, and he was actually a man known as Anton Pilipa, who was another missing persons case, which seems to be crazy that in the search for one missing person, they find another. Anton Pilipa had disappeared from Toronto, Canada, five years prior to his discovery. Anton had walked all the way from Toronto to the Amazon in Brazil. Even though this is great news for Anton Pilipa, and his family and friends, this sadly means that Lars Mitonk is still a missing person. Considering the lack of evidence and lead way for this case, there is a lot of speculation as to what might have really happened to Lars. We really got lost in the abyss on this case. We collected so many little pieces of information that seemed unclear or somewhat insignificant on the surface, but they became extremely significant when these theories of what might have happened came into play. And we're going to talk about some of those right now because they get really convoluted and crazy. So the first theory is that Lars developed some sort of mental illness. He had some kind of psychotic break, but Lars had no history of mental illness. We know that Some mental illnesses can come on pretty suddenly and can come up in the mid to late 20s for some people, but this all seemed to happen in such a short period of time and corresponded with some strange things, so there's a lot of other theories of what might have happened. Another theory is that the antibiotic that he was prescribed caused some sort of psychosis. We found a study of a 35-year-old woman that took the same antibiotic that Lars was on and developed psychosis. Her symptoms started on the second day, which is what Lars was on, and persisted throughout the course of her antibiotics. So that definitely could have been what was happening here. It may have been that he developed some kind of strange side effect that no one really caught and maybe when he ran out into the woods he was hurt or got disoriented or something like that. We know overdosing on this medication can cause seizures and blackouts and convulsions and if I remember correctly they never found the bottle like in his belongings. Yeah everywhere we read nothing mentioned anything about them finding this bottle of medication. Sort of along these lines, too, um, another theory is that maybe when he got in the fight that the blow to his head was a lot worse than they thought, and maybe he had some kind of mild traumatic brain injury that caused some sort of disorientation or something like that. But from there, the theories get super wild. Yeah, and this next one, I feel like I'm most partial to as it being most realistic, but it's also the biggest stretch but some reason these pieces just fit together so perfectly it seems almost unfathomable that it could be a coincidence so this next theory has to do with underground organ black markets we read a lot about this and a lot about these black markets that are happening in bulgaria and russia and the ukraine and all kinds of places like that And in this theory, the doctor that Lars originally saw may have been involved. The doctor may have seen Lars as a good mark because he was alone. He needed medical attention for his ear, so he was vulnerable. He was otherwise healthy, non-smoker. He was young and in shape. Kind of the ideal for organ thieves, I guess. Organs can get really high prices on the black market. We saw reports from the World Health Organization and several other organizations that stated A kidney can get between $100,000 and $200,000, and hearts can go for over a million. So this market is pretty ambiguous because it's very tied to organized crime. They're very good at covering it up. Everywhere we looked with official organizations said that it was on the rise and that it was a growing problem. There's even theories that the fight that Lars got into at the bar may have been orchestrated just to sort of keep him in the country, or that it was just sort of lucky for the doctor that this happened and brought Lars in and maybe it just had nothing to do with it. This would also kind of explain why Lars ran from the doctor's office that day at the airport. He may have either realized what was up or had known all along and thought maybe this doctor was also involved or that the construction worker walking in had something to do with it. So it may have been real or a perceived threat, but having to do with him knowing that there were people after him. Generally, organ traffickers target vulnerable people and kind of manipulate them into doing this, but there have been cases of travelers just disappearing or being attacked. So 
it definitely could fit into this case. And the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe said that these rings can be international and they usually include brokers, recruiters, local medical professionals, as well as enforcers. So we kind of have the breakdown on our website. You can look more into that. But basically, these rings operate very similarly to organized crime. So they're very hard to infiltrate. They're very hard to get information on because everyone is very tight-lipped. It's easy to bribe or manipulate or, you know, have officials in on it. In 2006, three accused organ recruiters were convicted along with many other cases we found. And even in 2019, a kidney trafficking ring was broken up in Bulgaria, resulting in charges being laid against four people. And that just solidifies the fact that it's been going on for a long time. Some people were accused in 2006, and yet there was still another ring broken up in 2019. That's something that's been going on for years and years and could easily have been something that Lars got caught up in. Yeah, and Bulgaria, Russia, Thailand, and the Philippines were all named multiple times in our research. So Bulgaria was definitely a hot spot for this. And I think this one theory really stuck with me because... We were just researching the case, getting the information, and we both, on our own, thought about this antibiotic, and we were like, maybe something weird's going on with it. We researched the antibiotic, and then Brittany found out about this black market, and then it all just started kind of piecing together. Yeah, it really fits every piece of it, why he would run, why he was scared. Even being in a hotel right by the airport, there could be a lot of drug smuggling, a lot of black market type of business going on yeah yeah you mentioned how good it would have been for them to be at the airport because it's like you can easily transport to anywhere in the world and after reading some books about the way mafias work with contract killers and people like that it definitely isn't a far shot things like this really do happen and it may seem like a stretch but it's insane what they'll do to get their way Yeah, money really talks, especially in black markets and lone travelers that may be vulnerable or anything like that are definitely targets. Another theory we saw was that either Lars alone or Lars and his friends were smuggling drugs into the country. Maybe something went wrong and Lars was made to stay behind as insurance while his friends left. And maybe the whole fight wasn't either as severe or maybe it didn't happen at all. If Lars was a drug mule, his behavior could have been caused by a burst bag of drugs in his body, getting him high or even overdosing, and it also could have explained his lack of eating earlier in the trip. If this was the case, he really could have had people after him trying to get the drugs back or trying to punish him for something that had happened. And some people say that instead of a construction worker entering the doctor's office that day, that it was an airport security guard, and maybe that spooked Lars because he knew he was carrying stuff that he shouldn't have been so that's why he ran and then maybe he overdosed or was hurt in the woods or something like that we also read a couple places that doctors had recommended Lars not fly for up to 30 days which seemed really crazy to me because first of all like we said flying with a perforated eardrum is not prohibited and by any means and while it may have been painful he had many options to get home he could have taken the train he could have taken a coach anything like that and I think staying in the country for 30 days was kind of absurd. So I don't know if that was true or just sort of a theory that's thrown around. But those are some of the theories that we went through when we were researching this case. So if you guys know anything about Lars Mitonk, make sure to send in any information you get. If you have any sightings, you can call the investigative agency at 49151. 61378673 61378673 or you can call the German police anyone who may be able to use this information that you have to solve this missing persons case. So thanks for tuning in and listening to these two stories. We hope that you enjoyed them. They were super weird ones. We enjoyed sharing it with you. If you have any suggestions for future cases, be sure to contact us. You can do that through our website or through Instagram. We have a lot of ideas coming up, so we're excited to share all that with you. Don't forget to subscribe and rate us, follow our Instagram, look at our website for all the supplemental materials. We have a lot of pictures and all of our sources, so you can kind of dive into the abyss yourself and um, see all the stuff that we couldn't include. There's a lot of stuff on that organ black market that was super crazy. So it's definitely a rabbit hole you could get down. 
And don't forget that February 7th will be our first book club episode. We'll be talking about The Whisper Man by Alex North. So we hope to see you there. So thank you guys for jumping into the abyss with us and we will catch you next time. Bye. <laughs> he then confided nailed it <laughs> he's dry did you see that bug no he flew real close to my head while I was trying to take a drink I did not see him and I did not see him <laughs> quiet on fit I hope you fiddling with that little cord ain't doing stuff cause you've been fiddling with this little cord <laughs> you really can't hear much like when the clock was going off you couldn't hear another recording at all <laughs> you have been talking to Kirk <laughs> <laughs> Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know what? Give it to me, Brittany. What? <laughs> okay. 28 year old man living in Berlin. <laughs> My voice was doing good. Making your little crochet with a wire. <laughs> Acting like a fool. <laughs> Don't judge me. <laughs>